costs are staggering. Every time I talk about it, it hurts. He stood over me, click, 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 click. If you're not living in it, or if you've never experienced it, you would understand. One thousand two hundred and eighty. That's the number of shootings in Detroit in 2015. Two hundred and forty-five homicides. One thousand and thirty-five non-fatal shootings. Of course, those numbers don't even come close, not at all, to telling the full story. What happens when someone gets shot? What happens to the victims, their families? Who's paying the price? It's a large toll. That's what we found out during this journey. Me, my photographer, Johnny Sarton, also producer, Lisa Gass. I've been on the streets for about 14 years, working nights, going to a lot of these scenes. I take it that's the victim right there. Did you duck for cover and get down? Of course I did. I mean, like this. And the same question keeps coming up. How do you do what you do? Don't you bring this stuff home with you? Looking at the crying mothers, the crying brothers and sisters, those violent crime scenes throughout the city. The answer is, of course I do. I'm human just like everybody else. I try to bury it in my subconscious, but it still eats at me and bothers me every day. I may go home and think about it for two or three days, but unfortunately, it's on to the next story. You ever stop smiling? No? Except for when I'm asleep. Except for when you're sleeping? <laughs> How you feel right now? You feel good? You feel kind of strong? Yes. You feel positive? Yes. The first part of this journey brought us to little nine-year-old India Williams. She was shot two years ago when she was seven years old. She was just riding her bike down the street when someone came up and started firing shots. She was an innocent victim. She's now in a wheelchair and told she may never, ever walk again. You know how to whip and nay nay. Come on, ready? You gonna do it again. Right? What? <laughs> That's all you're doing? That's all you're doing? I couldn't run to her fast enough, so, I mean, it was like I was moving too slow. She was on the ground calling for me, and I never expected to be her or nobody's kid, but it happened. We just came home from church. She was outside playing, riding her bike like a normal kid, and was a victim of gun violence. She was just being herself. We got to Children's Hospital on a busy day on 75, less than seven minutes. So he made sure it happened. That's how I think everybody sees this <laughs> stuff. They think of their own family and their kids, of, you know he what did. I mean, and try and act <laughs> the same way. I mean, I don't, I just, I was thankful for him showing up at the scene, because I, I don't know, I was stuck, like literally. I don't think I would have been able to react or anything, because I was numb and I was just staring like, this can't be my baby, and I'm in the medical field. I knew what to do, I knew what steps to take but I was stuck. Trying to get her there safely, trying not to wreck the car, you know, trying to deal with traffic, uh, worrying on what's going on in the back. Is she still alive? Are, is she gonna make it? What do you think about you being in this wheelchair? It's fun. You think being in the wheelchair is fun? What do people say to you when they come up and talk to you? I want a little girl. That you're a beautiful little girl. <laughs> How many people come up to you and say you're a beautiful little girl? Everybody? I said that to you earlier, Some didn't I? Some of almost everybody. Some of almost everybody. How difficult is it to see your baby right here in a wheelchair trying to get back to a normal life? It's very difficult. Um, seeing her not being able to just go run and play with the rest of the kids, it's more harder on me, I think, than it is on her. Because throughout the whole thing, she's been okay. Like, she just keep trying and working harder and... What are you thinking about now? Because I see you getting emotional. Because every time I talk about it, it hurts, so... That's my baby. She can't... She's not normal no more. Do you ever remember somebody ever telling you you wouldn't be able to walk? My mom said that the nurse said that I wasn't going to be able to. But you don't believe that, right? I don't believe it. You're going to walk. Yes. All right, I'll help you down. I 
know you see it every day, but do you think about the future with her? Definitely. Um, Need help? Are you good? I'm good. Okay. I don't know if it's gonna get harder for her or easier. I don't know, cause only time will tell, but it's definitely things that I think about, like what will happen when she's not around me with the other kids. It's just emotionally and physically if she's gonna be able to handle it and it hurts me thinking about it, so. What's, what's the prognosis that they're giving you? Um, well, the doctor uh, ruled her out as being paraplegic, which is um, paralyzing the chest down. Financially, physically, emotionally, you can't put a price on gun violence. It just needs to stop. I don't know, I just, and then for her, the person who actually shot her and no justice was served, even though that they did all that they could and people still didn't want to come up and speak and talk and most people know who done it, it's sad. It's really sad. It's hard to tell you how you feel after you talk to a little girl in a wheelchair who has the courage to press on and has no idea really what kind of fight she has ahead of her. Her mother told me that she still cries two years later, privately in the corner of her house. She doesn't want her daughter to see, but still cries every time she looks at her. You know, when I do something like this, I selfishly think about my own family, my two sons. What would I do? What would happen if they were just outside playing with a baseball, riding their bike, and they were shot, an innocent victim? Would I have the courage to let complete strangers into my house and bear my soul? I don't know the answer to that. Right now, I'd probably say no. Moving takes a lot of wind. And by the time I get to the car, I have to do another breather. And you do that, and then we go. <laughs> I don't go downstairs. If it's a lot of stairs, I don't go down them. That leads us to 26-year-old Donovan Gray. He was robbed and shot at a gas station in March of 2016. He has a smile on his face, a spirit about him that's unmatched despite the fact that he has mounting medical bills, no insurance, and those bills are reaching somewhere near $20,000. March 10th at 2 o'clock in, in, in the afternoon, actually at 2.07, I called my uncle on the ground at 2.10. I remember everything, vividly, everything. He stood over me, click, 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 click. How many times were you shot? Five times. Where were you shot? I was shot four times in my right leg, one time in my buttocks. So what's that right there we're looking at? That's the one that went through and through. It's a big hole. They like they don't know if that's ever really, really gonna heal. Right. You still have fragments yep. inside your leg? Uh-huh. Still got fragments. Okay, man, I don't want you to hurt yourself. Yeah. That's another one? Yep. Whew. It went in. It, they said the bullet even went on this side or on this side. When it went in, it shattered all of this in the middle. They had to go straight through my middle and take something out and make something. I was asleep. <laughs> I was asleep on that part. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, huh? Yeah. They was telling me Medicaid was gonna take care of it or go and back pay with it. They're still not taking care of it. <laughs> they, I'm still having to pay for prescriptions. I'm still having to pay for every time I go to the hospital. I'm still having to pay for gauze. When you are a shot victim and you having no insurance, they send you home with no AC wrap. They send you home with no gauze. All that stuff is on you. How much money do you think you would have lost from being a victim of a gunshot? Whew. Out of just out of medical, at least 20,000, 20, at least. I still got to go back to the hospital. How are you going to possibly pay for $20,000 or more in medical bills without insurance? How are you going to come up with that money? At this point, I really don't know. Only thing I can do is hope and just pray that I find some type of help or I find some type of structure where I can make that type of money to pay off before I'm an old man and I'm just buried in debt because they're telling me like I'm gonna have to come to the hospital at least every six months just because I have metal in my leg, just for checks and just because just in case it moves. So that's that's very scary, especially being at my age. You know, it's very scary to know that you gotta go to the hospital every 
six months for the next 10, 15 years, just because somebody else wanted to do some harm to you, not that you want to do harm to somebody else, not that it was a payback, not that you took advantage of a situation, just because you want to do harm to somebody. I don't, I don't understand that. Most of the hospitals and doctors we talk to say most bullets are not removed. It all depends on where it hits the body. There could be damage to blood vessels, nerves, bones. Just a few millimeters makes a whole big difference. The difference between a few thousand dollars to tens of thousands of dollars. According to Blue Cross Blue Shield, the national average for inpatient treatment of a gunshot victim is somewhere around $22,000. And of course, that all varies depending on the injury, surgery, follow-ups, and physical physical therapy. And one more thing, of course, do not forget about those ambulance rides. According to the city of Detroit, that could cost a victim anywhere from $450 to $900 if they do not have insurance. Donovan Gray, he broke down all of his medical bills for us. He says for a four day stay at the hospital, that cost him about $7,200. And remember, he does not have insurance. So he has to pay for all of his medications, also his injury supplies like ACE bandages. That right there is hundreds of more dollars. He also has to pay $25 to $50 for a bathroom seat, $75 for a walker. And remember, he has to go to physical therapy. That's costing him about $225 each and every session. And doctors are telling him he should go to at least 14 different sessions. Also, future hospital bills. Well, he'll have to go back for follow-ups and things like that. That's a whole bunch of money and all of those lost wages he'll have from not working as a tattoo artist. Okay, you shot me. Now I gotta pay for all these bills, but forget these bills because before you shot me, I had bills. So what do I do about the bills I had before you shot me? Which ones do I take care of first? So now I have no power. Yeah, I have no water. I have none. I have none of that in my house right now. None, none of that. I have none of that in my house. Um, Are you living with family right now? Yeah, I'm living with my. Know? I'm living with family right now. But at the same time, you know, they're looking out for me because it's family. But at the same token, you it's can't. Bad. Yeah, I feel bad because I feel like I'm, you know, I'm moving in. I'm taking up space, and I know I got a whole house for myself. You know, guys came through, kicked my back door in. After the second or third day I was in the hospital, I got a call from my neighbor on the, uh, Somebody on the street. Somebody robbed you while you were in the hospital? While I was in the hospital. What do you think about this when the guy came in here and just fired a <laughs> shot? Uh, he, I told him, what, what are you doing, man? He told me, wait, wait. I said, something like that, he went back and come up with the shotgun. I said, what the hell are you doing? Is he crazy or something? For what? I mean, he started shooting. He shot one time and ran away. Have you seen anything like that before? Nope. No. <laughs> no. No. Never. Unbelievable. Yeah, it is unbelievable. What we continue to learn throughout this journey is that somebody has to pay for this. Somebody has to pay for the people who have no insurance, who need medical help when they are shot. Well, of course, who are those people? It's us. It's the taxpayers. Well, according to the state, not including self-inflicted and unintentional injuries, taxpayers, they shelled out more than $7.6 million in Medicaid payouts throughout the state. Nearly 45% of that, more than $3.4 million, came from the city of Detroit alone. And that does not include the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars related to any cost for riding an ambulance. Well, we rode along with police, Detroit police, for several days out here. They're doing everything they can to reduce guns and get guns off the streets. These are all homicide long guns. These were all used in connection with a homicide in the city of Detroit. They did us a favor, a privilege. They took us inside the gun vault, their secret location, never been shown before to any media at all. Last year, they tell me in 2015, they recovered 3,645 guns. We got a chance to take a look at all the guns they've taken off the streets. How many different types of guns do you think are down here? Well, I would say that we have probably one of every type of gun weapon ever made. I know nothing about guns, but if I were to walk in here, it looks like there's a lot of long guns, you know? I mean, yes. I'm sure there's handguns in the barrels, but it seems like the majority of this stuff, especially if it was crimes, looks like a long gun, a rifle, or stuff like that. Is that what people are, is that their gun of choice, so to speak? Um, a lot of these are shotguns, and that's uh, 
uh, probably a gun of choice a lot of times. Um, they saw them off to make them more deadly. What's the one gun or the one thing that might have shocked you or you were like, wow, I can't believe this was on the streets or, you know, this came in here. Is there anything that really like stood out to you? Uh, we took in a, a AR-15 or actually an M-16 that had a grenade launcher attached to it. And that kind of... And it, somebody was using that on, on the streets? They probably didn't have the grenades for the grenade launcher, but they had that weapon. Many times there's blood, biological evidence, blood on this stuff, and you realize the impact and the toll it's taking on the family. This is important stuff. You're keeping track of all the guns that could solve crimes and help people, and you know what I mean? The, the justice and the closure that people like to talk about. Idiots like me and reporters want to <laughs> ask for the justice and the closure. This is the room that can bring that, and, this, and you're one of the men in charge of you know, keeping everything intact. Well, we're, we're proud that we find everything. We've got a handle on it. We Sometimes it's not exactly where it's supposed to be, but we, we track it down and we find it. And it makes us feel really good, especially when we know it's going to court and they need it. Well, those bills, they just keep piling up and piling up for taxpayers. 245 homicides last year. In 2015, we're told each homicide victim must go through an autopsy. Wayne County, they could not give us an exact figure or breakdown for the cost, but doing some research in other counties, that could be anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 for each one. That means for taxpayers last year around here, that's $367,000 all the way up to $735,000 for those autopsies. Detroit 911. The other guy ran up on the porch, grabbed his gun, and he got a shooting at the block, and I got hit in my shoulder. We had the chance to talk with Detroit's chief. He says they're making a whole lot of progress out there on the streets, but it's nothing to write home about yet. Overall, our violence right now is sitting at about a 6% reduction overall. Homicides are about a 7% reduction this year compared to last year, which as I reported, 47-year right. low. And here we are in the second quarter of this year. Already beating those numbers. And we're already, but again, I'm, I can't get excited. I certainly can't wave a flag right, of success. Right. Progress, absolutely. They knew the victim was shot. They probably already was chilling in the car with that gun. So since the police was coming, yeah, they probably. He can't chill in the car with his gun and call us. He got to get rid of it before we come and help him, right? We do randomly find guns, but I think there's a good chance. <laughs> right, right. This yeah, has some smoke. Sort of... There's fire. Right, this right. is right. pretty ironic. Yeah, right. That we found a gun. Right. I, I know you probably talk often directly to some of the families who lost loved ones or I dealing do. with a gunshot. W what's your message to them? What, what are you telling them in those conversations when nobody else is around but you really want to make a difference with them and let them know that you really are trying and you guys really are doing everything you possibly can for them and everybody else? Victims families matter too. Victims' families matter too. A lot of people ask me personally, like, how do you do what you do? You know what I mean? Specifically, how do you go out to a crime scene and not bring that home? You know? And a lot of the times, I'm no different than an officer. I may bottle it up and it may affect me and I don't know how to get it out. Do some of these things, do you bring that home and it affects you emotionally or mentally like it would affect me? And I, I say I don't, I want to put it in my subconscious and tuck it away, but I just can't. Is that, well, is that something that affects you like it would affect some of us too? Well, certainly I care. Uh, I care when certainly when there's a very young victim or an old victim, you know, you think about your family, you think about your parents. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, 39 years in this business, I've learned to embrace and focus on outcomes, uh, trying to make a difference. Number six is right here. The police department is different today. Mm -hmm. uh, people stop me, they tell me, they say, well, chief, we feel different. We feel safer. We feel the police officers are different. Uh, we feel like we're engaged. Mm -hmm. And that's a key piece, the engagement. You hear about 
young kids getting shot. All the time. All the time. Yep. Some stuff don't even make the news. You seem, you know, like this has hit you. Like you, you feel like it's this is your city and you know, you're kind of sick and tired of you're this tired, stuff. You're tired, you're tired, you're tired. You know what I'm saying? You go to the suburbs, they can do all that. They can, they can go to their parks. We can't even take our kids to their parks. For what? We scared because somebody gonna shoot it up. You think taxpayers know how much money is tied up in gun violence and shootings and how much money goes to the treatment of, you know, the victims, those who are still living, all the different costs that are associated with a single gunshot? I doubt any of us appreciates the full cost of uh, a single gunshot from the taxpayer dollars that are used for uh, the medical treatment, the societal cost of losing someone's income potential. How does that affect you personally when you hear these stories? Well, as a parent, whenever I hear about um, a killing, a murder uh, of a child, it makes me really angry. I mean, I know it's, it's sad, but it also makes me angry because a child is such an innocent victim and just deserves so much better. I think we need to do a better job in our community with conflict resolution. Um, you know, people will use guns to commit crimes, but so often these days we see people are in a personal beef with somebody about something and will go shoot up a house. And their beef was with an adult individual, but the victims so often are very young and innocent children. And so that makes me angry. Listen, no matter what the numbers say, it always, always comes back to the victims and their families. The price they pay, unforgiving, nobody could ever put a dollar amount on that. What we found out is people have a choice. They can be a victim or a survivor. And that was clearly evident when we talked to Tony Dixon. She lost her 22-year-old son in September of 2013. He was shot, robbed at a gas station of his cell phone. The path of a single bullet, just one bullet, changed her life forever. And now she's actually looking at her cell phone and her granddaughter for comfort. Oh, vitamin water was his favorite. <laughs> that flavor. I actually have vitamin waters that he drank out of in my refrigerator in the garage. I'm, I'll never throw them away. Really? Yeah, I'll never throw them away. It's changed my life forever. So, we've never had a murder in our family. So for it to be a kid who was raised the right way, morals, values, integrity, um, it's hard. You just, you have to learn to live. You gotta learn to live. Some days are better than others. You say you never get over it, right? I mean, oh. so when people say something like that, that's the stupidest thing you can say, because if, if you're not living in it, or if you've never experienced it, you wouldn't understand. You just, you learn to live. Either you learn to live, or you fall into a state of depression, or it'll kill you. I just really wish it was a way for me to tell her I appreciate her being in my life. I love you. I smile past the pain. I have a beautiful granddaughter. Um, she is my son's twin with ponytails. We hear all the time, you know, us idiot news reporters talk about closure. Yeah. To you, that's, that's another dumb phrase, right? It's a dumb phrase for me, for me. And I, I would think that anybody who's walking in my shoes, you never get closure. Not even if the person is caught or they go to jail because you'll never understand the why. Why did you do it? You didn't have to do it. I would have bought you 10,000 phones. You murdered him because you felt like it. My son got shot one time in the back of his neck. One bullet. And he's gone. So I got something that we've been carrying around, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna give it to you. Okay. You just tell me what you think. Okay. A bullet. Yep. I'm a CPO carrier. Mm -hmm. What I don't play with is guns and bullets mm -hmm. because they take the lives of so many people. Now, how'd you know I was gonna pull this out? 
You just knew? Intuition. Yeah. Intuition. Um, it's serious. It's very, very serious. Look, it's hard to sum up what we learned on this journey. How would you ever describe talking to a nine-year-old girl in a wheelchair who may never ever walk again, but looks you in your face and tells you her wheelchair is fun? The price is steep, the pain is real, it will never ever go away. There's no such thing as closure, but somehow, some way, these families continue to push on with a smile on their face, even though the path of a bullet led them down a road most would crumble on. Remember this, always remember this, behind every person killed, every tax dollar spent, every cop going out on just one more lead. There's a family member left behind, standing tall, saying, I am a survivor.